Welcome back everybody. I will talk today about hypotension in neonates and I choose this subject because uh, many times I've been asked which uh, is the best uh, inotrope to use in neonates and when to use it. And uh, it happened many times that uh, some doctors will prefer to give uh, volume expanders immediately when they think that the blood pressure is uh, low in that specific neonate. So the aim or the objectives of my lecture are to define hypotension. We will talk about how to measure uh, blood pressure in units and what are the normal blood pressure readings. We need uh, some talk about the transition from the fetal to perinatal life and uh, then we'll talk about uh, when to treat hypotension. Uh, then we'll talk about treatment options and uh, after that we will talk about the different inotropic and vasopressor agents from mechanism of action then from indications for use. And lastly we will present a al proposed algorithm on how to apply uh, what we have learned in managing babies with hypotension. Uh, in units which is different from adults and pediatric population, we use the mean blood pressure as the most often uh, uh, measurement to define hypotension. Why? Because it was found that systolic blood pressure uh, rarely represents the systemic perfusion. So it was found that the mean blood pressure is more important to reflect the systemic perfusion rather than the systolic blood pressure which we use to use in neonates in pediatric and adult population. Practically speaking, any value that falls below the fifth or sometimes the tenth percentile for gestational and postnatal ages. While if we think about the physiology behind the need to define uh, hypotension, we can think of hypotension as the point at which cerebro cerebrovascular autoregulation is lost, leading to cerebral function compromise and tissue ischemia. Well, empirically, and this is a very common uh, practical point, the gestational age in weeks has been used to define the lower limits of mean blood pressure during the first day after birth. The blood pressure this is a very important point to know, the blood pressure rises significantly during the first 72 hours of life, irrespective of gestational age. So all preterm infants should have a mean blood pressure greater than 30 millimeter mercury by this time. So remember please this number, regardless of how extremely preterm the baby is, by three days of life, the minimum accepted blood pressure is 30 millimeter mercury. Does this mean that we have to treat any baby with a number less than this? Better to see later. How do we measure blood pressure in units? Usually the gold standard is a direct reading from an indwelling arterial line. But more commonly we use non-invasive methods which are monitoring uh, uh, of the blood pressure by the use of Doppler or oscillometric techniques. The problem of these techniques, the non-invasive techniques, is that it has, uh, the, uh, it's unable to provide continuous monitoring uh, uh, as a major drawback of these techniques. Uh, more important, when we check blood pressure, we will not depend on the low blood pressure to start management. We need a rather evidence of low systemic hypoperfusion. So again, we depend on the mean blood pressure, which correlates generally with the gestational age of the baby. After three days, the minimum accepted is 30 millimeter mercury. In addition to the blood pressure reading, we have to look for signs of systemic hypoperfusion. And please remember these points. Capillary refill time more than three seconds two to core temperature difference more than two degrees Celsius, urine output less than one ml per kg per day. Of course, this is uh, not applicable in the first day of life when we do accept the urine output down to 0.5 ml per kg per hour and rising lactate. 
This table represents the uh, accepted uh, blood pressure according to gestational age, as you can see on the uh, left side. Here the gestational age and here the uh, age in hours, the postnatal age in hours. At any gestation and at 72 hours of age, the minimum accepted blood pressure, mean blood pressure should be 30. This is a golden rule. And here if you see that the blood pressure will start rising, Usually it correlates in the zero hour to the gestational age of the baby and then starts rising every hour until it reaches a minimum of 30 in 72 hours of age. You can refer to lots of different uh, uh, tables in the literature. And this is just one example of these tables. Now we'll talk about the fetal circulation. It's a very important subject in order to understand why blood pressure or why hypotension occurs in some babies. Normally, the placenta will send blood to the umbilical vein, which is an oxygenated blood coming from the mother and goes to the inferior vena cava through passing uh, by passing through the ductus venosus through the liver and then it joins the inferior vena cava. Now most of the blood entering the right atrium will be shifted directly to the left atrium through the patent foramen ovale, but some of it will be ejected down to the right ventricle and then it goes to uh, the pulmonary circulation, but it does not go beyond the ductus arteriosus only minimal amount will go through the uh, uh, umbilical uh, arteries sorry in the uh, uh, pulmonary arteries while most of it will be shifted through the ductus arteriosus and then it joins the systemic circulation as we said, in the right atrium, most of the blood will be shifted through the patent foramen ovale to the left atrium, then it is shifted down to the left ventricle and goes to the systemic circulation. Then after joining or after perfusing the tissues of the fetus, it will go back to the uh, placenta through the two pulmonary arteries. Immediately after birth, what will happen is that when we clamp the uh, uh, umbilical cord, what will happen immediately that the systemic vascular resistance will increase dramatically. In addition to the decrease in the pulmonary vascular resistance due to breathing of the baby and negative intrathoracic pressure. Now these changes will cause increment in the systemic blood pressure and decrease, uh, uh, and decrease in the pulmonary uh, blood flow and will result in closure of the ductus arteriosus and patent foramen ovale. Any disturbance in this physiologic process may result in hypotension which may persist and cause problems to the baby. So what are the factors that contribute or may contribute to hypotension in the preterm unit? Well, sometimes the myocardium itself, when it is immature in extremely premature babies, uh, the immaturity of the myocardium and the decreased contractility of the myocardium will result in the hypotension. If the transition which we discussed just now, uh, the transition from the fetal to prenatal uh, circulation, uh, any problem that happens in this transition may result in hypotension uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, this one uh, is supposed to cause increment in the systemic vascular resistance of this ink. If this increment does not occur, then the baby will end up with hypotension. We have a, the patent ductus arteriosus with the left to right shunt, which will cause the steel phenomena or steel syndrome, and this will result in systemic hypotension. In some cases, when we have evidence of perinatal asphyxia, hypoxia, or neuroendocrine uh, neuro changes, it will cause increment in the systemic uh, uh, vascular resistance. And uh, if we have positive pressure ventilation, 
we have positive pressure ventilation and uh, this one will affect the venous return to the heart and will cause uh, 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 decrease, uh, decrease in the uh, uh, function of the heart and the amount pumped by the heart to the systemic circulation so this will result in hypotension in cases of sepsis we know that sepsis will cause peripheral vasodilatation and increase vascular permeability so this will also result in hypotension uh, and we add to this that preterm babies are having relatively uh, uh, adrenal insufficiency and insufficient cortisol during the stress times and illness and this will contribute to the hypotension in preterm babies so why do we afraid from hypotension and what will happen to the baby if we do not treat hypotension the major or the most important effect is the poor neurological outcome so uh, uh, why this happens usually the uh, uh, cerebral auto regulation will keep the cerebral cel circulation e enough or appropriate regardless of the hypotension that happens to the uh, body but this autoregulation uh, is immature in preterm babies so during hypotension the brain will be affected by decreased flow and during hypertension it will be affected by increased flow as a result the preterm babies are particularly susceptible to ischemia with low blood pressure and to hemorrhage with high blood pressure and of course the results will be poor neurodevelopmental outcomes okay now we understand that uh, uh, why uh, it happens uh, or why some newborn babies develop hypotension and what's the uh, major uh, or the disadvantage of, uh, of hypotension or sequela of hypotension to that newborn now we will go to management of hypotension now we need to understand a few important aspects before going back to going uh, deep to uh, the drugs that we use in managing hypotension the treatment of hypotension should be directed to address the underlying pathology so always look for the underlying pathology before start targeting the figure itself what are the common treatments used? Two entities actually, the volume expansion and vasopressors or inotropes in addition to corticosteroids. So volume expansion or medication. We need to know also that treatment should be based on the overall clinical picture rather than the number. So it's not only the mean blood pressure, but also we should include other parameters of systemic hypoperfusion as mentioned before. So frequent evaluation of vital signs, perfusion, urine output, chemistry, neurological status, in addition to serum lactate are or should be used to monitor and guide therapy. In addition to the new modality of using uh, uh, functional echocardiography in order to assist, uh, assist in diagnosing and managing these infants. Okay, what about volume expanders? In general, the early use of volume expansion with normal saline, fresh frozen plasma, albumin, plasma substitute, or blood in very low birth weight infants with hypotension is not recommended. So, when you are informed as a physician about low blood pressure, please do not rush to give this baby volume expander. These volume expanders were found to be associated with intraventricular hemorrhage in preterm babies so be cautious in deciding when and how to give volume expanders now cautious administration of 10 to 20 ml per kg of volume expanders can be useful in situations in which fetal blood loss and hypovolemia are contributing to hypotension so if you have evidence of fetal blood loss or hypovolemia, consider giving the volume expanders. What if we have clear history of hemorrhage or severe anemia? Here we recommend giving packed red blood cells uh, instead of normal saline. Otherwise, isotonic crystalloid uh, solutions such as normal saline are preferred over colloids. 
Now we will start talking about the common drugs used in, in neonatal ICU to treat hypotension. The most important and most famous one is, of course, dopamine. Dopamine, as we know, it's, uh, it's, it's mostly used and it is actually recommended as the first line pharmacological treatment in hypotension. So the first line is dopamine. How does it work? It exerts most of its inotropic effects by releasing stored norepinephrine from the terminal nerve endings. Unfortunately, this is a limitation in some preterm babies because the reserve of norepinephrine is limited. So if we continue giving dopamine and decreasing the dose of dopamine, the baby will not take the benefits. He will stop taking the benefits because no more stored norepinephrine in the body. The mechanism directly is uh, is is by affecting uh, is is related to the dose of the dopamine. So it's dose dependent by stimulating alpha and beta adrenergic and dopaminergic receptors. At low doses, dopamine is known uh, uh, to to dilate the renal and splanchnic vessels. So it's called renal dose. Actually, these uh, uh, figures or information also came from pediatric and adult studies, uh, but it may be applicable to neonates. So at low doses, it dilates the renal and splanchnic vessels. At moderate doses from five to 10 milligram per kg per minute, it predominantly increases the cardiac contractility and heart rate. And at high doses, you can see the increment in peripheral vascular resistance. While these data came from uh, adult and pediatric studies, pharmacodynamic data on those related effects of dopamine in units are limited. We'll come now to the next most commonly used uh, drug, that's dobutamine. It is a synthetic, relatively uh, cardiovascular, uh, uh, relatively cardioselective inotrope that acts on the alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. The advantage of dobutamine is that it, it exerts a direct inotropic but limited chronotropic effect. So it has a direct inotropic effect that is independent of norepinephrine stores. It has minimal effect on the systemic blood pressure and afterload. Well, dopamine in general is the preferred drug for treating hypotension in units with myocardial dysfunction due to perinatal asphyxia. Now the common dilemma is to start dopamine versus dobutamine and this has been addressed in somewhat um, large amount of the literature. According to Cochrane meta-analysis, dopamine is more effective than dobutamine for the short-term treatment of hypotension in preterm infants. Dopamine is recommended as the first line agent with, when hypotension is caused by vasodilation, as seen in sepsis, for example, while dobutamine is a better choice in situations of compromised cardiac output that occurs, for example, in the first postnatal day of life. With hypotension due to shock, the myocardial dysfunction, impaired uh, systemic vascular resistance, and relative or absolute hypovolemia are best treated with a combination therapy of dobutamine and dopamine. We'll come now to another group which includes the, or uh, which is the endogenous catecholamines. We have epinephrine and norepinephrine. Epinephrine is a potent non-selective uh, alpha agonist action, it has a potent non-selective alpha agonist action and causes dilatation, sorry, activation of both beta-1 and beta-2 adrenergic receptors. Epinephrine increases blood pressure and systemic blood flow by increasing systemic vascular resistance and cardiac output. It causes disturbances in the carbohydrates and lactate metabolism. Of course, this is a, uh, a drawback. Most neurologists actually use epinephrine only in patients uh, who are unresponsive to high-dose dopamine. And due to uh, its effect on vascular tone and myocardial contractility, it presents an effective choice for uh, treatment of low systemic vascular resistance with or without impaired myocardial contractility. Examples, uh, septic shock or certain cases of perinatal asphyxia. 
For norepinephrine, it's rarely used. I myself, I have never used norepinephrine in, in ICU. What about vasopressin? This is uh, uh, a medication that's used by my teachers and it's been used long, uh, it's been used long ago. Uh, it's an antidiuretic uh, hormone that's formed in the hypothalamus and secreted from the posterior pituitary gland. It's used in the treatment of catecholamine resistant hypotension in uh, vasodilatory shock. The potent vasoconstrictive effects of vasopressin dominate when it's used as an infusion. So if you are going to use vasopressin, use it as infusion. Actually, no large RCTs uh, have evaluated the use of arginine vasopressin in neonatal population. So the use of vasopressin is not common in NICU. It's used by experts uh, who are really expert in this type of medication or it, uh, within the context of uh, 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 researches rather. What about merinone? Merinone is a selective phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor and exerts its cardiovascular effects by increasing cyclic AMP. So it enhances, it enhances myocardial contractility without raising uh, uh, myocardial oxygen consumption or increasing afterload. By the way, this medication is liked by the pediatric cardiologists. The uses of milrinone can be summarized in three cases. For low cardiac output after corrective surgery for congenital heart disease, for persistent pulmonary hypertension of the neonate, and for low blood pressure in extremely preterm infants. The major adverse effects of milrinone are thrombocytopenia and hypotension requiring vasopressors. So it's not preferable to start milrinone before starting pressors. What about hydrocortisone? Uh, now, hydrocortisone uh, can be helpful in cases of uh, uh, hypotension through different mechanisms, including upregulation of cardiovascular uh, adrenergic receptors and angiotensin II receptors, in a inhibition of catecholamine metabolism, so the presence of catecholamine in the body will last longer, increase in the intracellular calcium concentration. In the Cochrane review, it was found that no sufficient evidence to support its use in primary treatment of hypertension. But corticosteroids in the same Cochrane review, corticosteroids, uh, either hydrocortisone or dexamethasone, can be used to treat preterm infants with refractory hypertension uh, who are receiving already inotropes. Actually, it should not be used uh, uh, with endomethacin. And remember, if you decide to use hydrocortisone, uh, to take a baseline cortisol level. Now, we've presented many uh, uh, or most of the medications used in, uh, in ICU to treat uh, hypotension. But uh, we really need to, to follow steps. So I'm going to present a uh, a proposed algorithm on how to start treating hypotension in NICU. Please follow me step by step here. If our aim actually when we have a low blood pressure with evidence of systemic hypoperfusion is to increase the blood pressure or the mean blood pressure to a level that's equal or more than the gestational age. So start by fluid bolus if there is hypovolemia. Start by giving 10 ml per kg. If there is evidence of blood loss, uh, consider further boluses or sepsis, of course. After 10 minutes, if the baby is still hypotensive, you can start by dopamine. So the, your start will be by dopamine at 5 microgram per kg per minute. And you can increase the dopamine after 15 to 20 minutes to uh, 10 microgram per kg per minute. The next step, when you reach dopamine, up to 10 microgram per kg per minute. Now it's time to think of giving dobutamine. So you will start dobutamine here at 10 microgram per kg per minute. And then you can check the baby after 15 to 20 minutes if the baby is still hypotensive, increase dobutamine by 
5 every 15 to 20 minutes until you reach 20. Once you reach dopamine 20, go back to dopamine and increase by 5 until you reach 20. So at this stage, we reached dopamine 20 and dopamine 20, so 20 for both of them. If the baby is still hypotensive, uh, uh, we prefer to start hydrocortisone at a dose of 2.5 mg per kg intravenous, followed by 2.5 mg uh, per kg intravenous Q6 to 8 hours. What if he continued to be hypotensive? Uh, here, we recommend doing an echocardiogram if possible to assess the myocardial function, uh, dysfunction or congenital heart defect. Or if the baby is having persistent pulmonary hypertension, you can refer to PPHN guidelines or you can consider starting him on melrinone. Now, if you have refractory hypertension, uh, here uh, it's uh, an option to start the baby on adrenaline at 100 or 1000 nanogram per kg per minute, but uh, uh, be cautious in extreme premature babies. And uh, lastly, consider noradrenaline or vasoprocine. Uh, luckily, I did not need to reach uh, this stage myself. So this is the algorithm and uh, hopefully you can review it uh, when you start managing your babies in the NICU. These uh, were my references and uh, thank you 